Justin Trudeau will tell you anything you want to hear. And then when you turn your back, he'll betray you. Who is Pierre Polyev and what does he stand for? He's been leader of the Conservative Party and His Majesty's loyal opposition for just over a year. And if you believe the polls, he soon might be Canada's next prime minister. But many Canadians simply don't know the man, what he stands for, what his thoughts are on the policies of the day. Sure, you may have seen the odd news clip, but have you really sat down and listened to him? Pierre Polyev agreed to sit down and talk with us today about what he sees for Canada's future, what drives him, and also reactions to some of the top news stories that we've been looking at in headlines over the last few days. Monsieur Polyev, merci pour le temps. Merci de l'invitation et joyeux Noël. Uh, this will be the, the full extent of the French that uh, I'm going to speak to you today, but I did it for a reason, and that is uh, your wife has recently made jokes in one of her speeches about the fact that nobody knows how to say your name. And so I thought I'd jump right in and ask you the tough question first. How do you say your last name? Because uh, I'll tell you, I've known you a long time, Pierre. That is a question that I get asked a lot by people who who've started to notice you and aren't quite sure what you're all about. How do you say his name? Well, the simplest way for an Anglophone to say it is Polyev. But it has been said many different ways. Um, the it's it's a name that comes directly from France. Uh, my father's uh, grandfather came from so be my great grandfather. He came directly from France to Saskatchewan, and so in France they tend to roll the last R, Poilievre, but no one says it that <laughs> way here. So Poilievre is fine. I, I'm e I'm easy with first name basis. At the end of the day, Brian, I don't care how you say my name as long as you know how to put an X beside it on election day. All right. On to uh, weightier topics. Um, yeah. You had to post about a couple of abhorrent incidents over the weekend, and I yeah. wanted to get your reaction on those. Uh, Catholic Church in Alberta burned to the ground. Uh, third Christian church that's been targeted by arson in Alberta over the past little while. Are you concerned that we might be seeing the start of a trend, as we did a couple of years back, of places of worship, particularly in this instance, um, Christian churches, being targeted for arson? Yes, and it seems uh, you never hear any condemnation by Justin Trudeau of when churches get burned down. Uh, I haven't seen any. Maybe he's mentioned it, but he certainly doesn't make much priority of protecting uh, Christians against violence, and uh, I think we have to condemn all violence against all religions. Um, we have seen a rise in hate crimes since Mr. Trudeau took office, uh, and uh, all different religions have been victims of it. We see, for example, um, Muslims have been murdered at a mosque in Quebec City. Uh, that was a ter obviously a terrorist attack against Muslims. Uh, there was another Muslim family killed in London. We've had synagogues uh, um, targeted with both vandalism, uh, fire bombings. Oh, and I should add uh, bullets uh, to the front door. I visited two shuls and schools in Montreal uh, about a week and a half ago that had been uh, firebombed or shot at. Uh, we have uh, Hindu uh, temples uh, spray painted. Uh, we had uh, a Sikh leader murdered, assassinated out front of his uh, Gurdwara in Surrey. So this is a terrifying uh, new phenomenon. We never had this before. Uh, I don't remember it before eight years ago, there being uh, a systematic and repetitious and continuous attack on places of worship. I'm sure there were individual incidents, but nowhere near this, this volume. We have to call it out. We have to bring in tougher laws and stronger security infrastructure to protect people and their right to worship free from fear and violence. Over the weekend, there was a young man arrested uh, facing charges related to what was described as in a, a, a plot to target Ottawa's Jewish community. You represent an Ottawa riding. You lived in the, in, in the city. How did it feel hearing that your town this was something that police said was imminently about to happen, an attack on the Jewish community. It's terrible, terrifying and horrifying. And we need to stand with Canada's Jewish community, which has been the victim of anti-Semitic hatred 
uh, on a scale uh, perhaps unprecedented in over half a century. Uh, this has uh, this re renewed phenomenon has was sparked by the uh, genocidal attacks of Hamas on October the seventh, uh, and unfortunately, the Jewish community is once again re-victimized uh, as uh, the hatred that uh, spilled over its the, Israel's borders on that day is now spreading around the world. So we must stand with Jews today and now and everywhere to protect them against this uh, hatred, uh, to keep them safe, to condemn terrorism and uh, violence, uh, and uh, to, to, to ensure that we remain the free country that so many waves of uh, immigrants came to over so many years. My ancestors came here for freedom. My wife's uh, family came here for freedom. I'm sure mm -hmm. yours did too. We didn't come here uh, to be under attack for our, our religion. We all should have, be able to live freely in this country. On a lesser scale than a terror plot, we've seen uh, protests that target Jewish businesses or even just anything with a link to <clears throat> a Jewish Canadian being targeted. Over the weekend, um, mall Santas in, in Toronto, in Ottawa and elsewhere were targeted. Uh, but, you know, most disturbingly, I think, from this rash of protests was the Eaton Centre last night. This video of a man telling a cop, I'll put you six feet deep. He's threatening a police officer with impunity. Um, I, I understand why the police may not have intervened at that exact moment, not wanting to escalate things and, and have a riot in the Eaton Center, but that's an incredibly disturbing uh, mindset, I, I guess you'd say, that people feel so emboldened that they can threaten police officers on video in a very public place. Yes, and look, you're welcome to protest for any cause you want, any cause anywhere in the world, but you are you can't make threats of violence against anyone, let alone a police officer. Um, that's where we draw the line. Uh, we live in a free country. You can support or oppose any cause you want. You can express any opinion you want, but where the, the criminal code draws the line is, A, you can't utter a violent threat to any other human, and B, you can't incite violence again any against a particular group. Uh, so, uh, that, I mean, I saw the comments. It seemed to me that this individual crossed that line. He threatened, viol threatened to murder, effectively, a, a police officer. And uh, you know, it was. I don't know what else he could have meant by stating that the the officer, the constable, should be put six feet under. Uh, but for whatever reason, there were no charges laid. Uh, and uh, we need to protect Canadians' right to freedom of expression. We cannot allow uh, threats of violence uh, to predominate. The, the war that Hamas launched against Israel on October 7th, this is obviously dividing Canadians. And we've seen in, in political parties, we've seen a divide um, in the prime minister's liberal party. And that's played out. Is there a divide in the conservative party? Where do you stand? Where does the party stand? Well, we, we we have one position. Um, you know, unlike Trudeau, who has who, who says one thing to one group and the opposite thing to the to another group. You know, he, uh, just quickly to ca recap where he's been, he was a hundred percent against a ceasefire, uh, and then a story broke that he was losing donations over his position. So then he completely reversed himself and voted for a UN resolution that would allow Hamas to keep the hostages, keep arms and prepare for its next next attack. Uh, so he did that because of donations, it, it would appear. Then uh, he sent out MPs from his caucus who represent Jewish writings to claim that they disagreed with him so that he could say one thing to one group and exactly the opposite to another group. And the, the message is where, regardless of where you stand on the Middle East, um, Justin Trudeau will tell you anything you want to hear, and then when you turn your back, he'll betray you. Um, our approach won't please everybody, but at least we're honest with people about where we stand. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, we think what's happening to Palestinians is horrible, and we think the culprit is Hamas. Hamas, uh, there was a ceasefire in place. Hamas launched uh, an unprovoked a genocidal attack killing more Jews than at any time since the Holocaust. 
Um, and since that time, Hamas has uh, tried to hide its worst terrorists uh, under hospitals and in other places where civilians necessarily gather. And uh, it, the reality is Hamas is responsible for this human suffering. We need to Hamas to surrender, give back the hostages, completely disarm, and then let's get working towards a two-state solution. I think we were on the route to doing that. Israel had signed peace agreements, the Abraham Accords with um, UAE, um, Bahrain, Morocco, mm -hmm. Sudan, and there was word that Saudi Arabia was next. Imagine if the home of Mecca and Medina were to sign a peace deal with Israel. Imagine the peace that could the peace that would have broken out in the Middle East. That could have meant a Palestinian state with extreme uh, prosperity uh, for the Palestinian people who have incredible geographical opportunities where they're located. So my my work as Prime Minister will be to encourage that the Abrahamic Accords to go further, for there to be peace between Arabs and Jews, and for that ultimately to lead to a, a free and independent Palestinian state living in harmony next to a Jewish state. Uh, and I believe that is possible. I'll take it from your answer that if you were Prime Minister, Canada would not have voted for the UN resolution last week. No, we do not. Okay. Uh, you can't have, you can't allow Hamas to keep the hostages, keep its arms, and just prepare for the next attack. And that's what this motion did. We all want an end to the violence uh, and as soon as possible. The only way for that to occur is to, for Hamas to be disarmed, for the hostages to be returned, and for the murderers of October 7th to be surrendered. And if those things happen, of course, there should be peace. Uh, and uh, then we can work uh, towards a Palestinian state and uh, a, a brighter future for all the, all the people who treasure the Holy Land. We'll get to domestic issues in a moment, but of course, with Canada's um, population, the, the two big wars going on right now become domestic issues as well. And we've seen that play out in, in Justin Trudeau saying that you and your party do not support Ukraine. Do you support Ukraine? Yes. Okay. But you've had to explain a lot. And the saying is that in politics, if you're explaining, you're losing. So having to explain why you voted against the Canada-Ukraine free trade deal, does that mean you're losing on that file? No, it's a carbon tax deal. Um, and anyone who doubts that, let me ask you a simple question. What would happen if this deal did not pass? Nothing. We already have a free trade deal with Ukraine. The only thing this does is add a bunch of preambulatory language about carbon taxes and other unrelated matters. So there's nothing in this deal other than adding a carbon tax, and we're against a carbon tax. So if, if we had voted for it, then the media would say, well, there the, the Tories are contradicting themselves, voting for a carbon tax. Are, are you um, worried that the, the deal will enshrine Canada's carbon tax in an international treaty? Is that it? Yes. Okay. So if you you think that if it, you know this goes through and then you become prime minister, that it would make it more difficult to, for Canada to ax the tax? Yeah, it would commit us to promoting quote carbon pricing, which is the term liberals use for a carbon tax. And if it doesn't do that, why is it in there? Once upon a time, um, the liberals would have been able to come at you for being against the carbon tax and come at you hard and just say, well, you don't care about the environment. That doesn't seem to be resonating the way that it used to. What do you think is, has changed that you can just, you know, you've got t-shirts uh, printed everywhere. You, you've got thousands of people showing up at Ax the Tax rallies. What changed? It didn't work. The carbon tax has not reduced emissions and it has impoverished the people. Every I told everyone when Trudeau brought this tax in that everything he said was a lie. And it's true. I, I was proven right. I said it would not stop at $50 a ton. He said, no, 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 it's going to 50 and no more. Now he says it's going up to 170, three times higher, plus a second carbon tax stacked on top of that. They said it would help us reach our targets. It didn't help us reach our targets. Uh, we've missed every target but for the year we were locked down. And their own environment commissioner says we won't hit our 2030 targets even 
with this carbon tax. Um, and three, he said it'd make everyone better off. You remember, you're going to get these checks that would make, well, now the parliamentary budget officer reveals that 60% of Canadians will pay more carbon tax cost than they get back in rebates. It's on page three of his analysis on the subject. I encourage anyone who doubts what I'm saying to go read it. You can look at how much you'll pay in your province net of rebates. So all those things were a lie. And now he wants to quadruple the tax. Quadruple it, Brian. This well, is ju just the other radical. day, Stephen Guibault said, uh, was asked, what about past 2030? Will you increase it past 170? And he said, we haven't made up our minds on that yet. Of course, so it's it's quadrupling between gradually, year by year, over the next six years. Uh, and then after that, going even higher. And that's just what they've told us. Remember, before the 2019 election, they said it would never go above $50. So they're now admitting it's going to be quadrupled. How much is the is it actually going to be raised? Um, my my common sense plan axes the tax. I will ax the tax, and we will have a carbon tax election. The next election is a is a referendum on the carbon tax, and there are only two options on the ballot. There's Pierre Polyev and the common sense conservatives who will ax the tax. And you've got Jagmeet Singh, Justin Trudeau, uh, Blanchette, and the Green Party who all agree with quadrupling the carbon tax. So take your pick, folks. You vote for Pierre Polyev and the Common Sense Conservatives, you ax the tax. You vote for the other four parties, you quadruple the tax. The carbon tax isn't the only controversial environmental policy that uh, the Trudeau and Guibault are, are pushing. Uh, they are getting involved in all kinds of areas of provincial jurisdiction, including regulations on electricity. But they also have this um, mandate that all all motor vehicles will have to be electric by 2035. I know that you've had criticisms around the EV deals that Trudeau signed with Stellantis, Volkswagen, particularly around the um, the issue of bringing in foreign workers for part of that. But on the wider issue, uh, our grid may not be able to handle full electrification of all vehicles by 2035. Would you keep that policy in place if you were prime minister, would you uh, perhaps look at what companies like Toyota and Honda are doing with more hybrid models to reduce emissions? Um, where would you be on that front? Look, we we think this there, there's a very serious risk that this will mean massive new costs for consumers, particularly low income people. Uh, electric vehicles are more expensive than our traditional internal combustion or hybrid models. So I worry that a lot of working class, low income people will not be able to own a car. That means they can't get to work. That means their lives are turned upside down. Uh, I would rather um, work with the province, with, sorry, work with the manufacturers uh, on incentives and smart light touch regulations that encourage more energy efficiency in each automobile that comes off the assembly line and uh, improve in small, in, in small incremental steps year after year after year, that would both reduce emissions and costs for consumers without risking a sort of um, uh, you know, massive increase in purchase price at the dealerships for our consumers. So I'm again, what, this could amount to a, a car tax in the end, a very large car tax, and it will hammer the poorest people the hardest as we know, as it always does. So common sense conservatives are going to protect consumers and businesses with by rejecting these kinds of extreme and radical policy shifts. You know, I, I just think of a building that I live in. It was built before uh, the <clears throat> advent of the electric car, uh, retrofitting it to uh, to have uh, everyone have the ability to charge their car would be extremely cost prohib prohibitive for the building, for the owners, for the tenants, it would drive up the cost of absolutely everything. Um, and then there's the electricity. Where do we get the electricity from? Mm -hmm. um, we need to massively increase our output, but the C69, the liberal energy regulation law, makes it very difficult to get uh, nuclear power plants, hydroelectric dams, or other energy sources onto the grid. Uh, so what I would do is repeal that law green light, green projects, we can have more nuclear, hydroelectric, uh, geothermal, and in some cases, natural gas power onto the grid so that we can power an electric future. Uh, and when people plug in 
their hybrid or their toaster, there's electricity that comes running through the wire. Yes, we, we do have to worry about toasters moving forward or ab absolutely everything if it won't work. But it, look, <laughs> unless, unless Gibo bans those two. Uh, well, sure you, you know, the European them. Union tried to ban um, uh, fast boiling kettles. And I think that was one of the things that <laughs> written over the edge for uh, for Brexit. Uh, so but let's not give Gibo any ideas. Uh, housing is an issue that um, appears to be a winner for you. Um, you come from a humble background, but you're doing pretty well right now. Like the PM, you live in a, a beautiful home in Ottawa. Uh, you're not worried about your your house payments. Well, I mean, I know you still have a, a home in South End of Ottawa, but this isn't something I'm worried that, about everybody else's. Yeah, but so how did you pick up on this issue um, when it's not something that would have been front of mind for you with saying, oh, wow, uh, look at what's happened. I picked up on this issue in late 2020, and what, what I was seeing is that um, housing costs were actually moderating in late 2029. They started to drop at the beginning of COVID. COVID should have caused housing prices to go way down. But then in, in spring of 2020, the central bank printed about $400 billion and kept printing. And that money started off, it's fed into the financial system. It's lent out disproportionately to wealthy investors who, whose connections in the banking system get them to the front of the line, and they then bid up housing housing prices. And they did. In the period after money printing began, housing costs rose 50% in two years. Uh, I think that's probably the fastest two-year increase ever, ever in Canadian history, uh, and it perfectly correlates with the time that money was being printed. Some people try to blame COVID. It makes no sense because, of course, COVID brought lower wages, lower GDP, uh, lower immigration, and um, the inability to actually go and visit houses. So COVID actually should have reduced housing costs, but uh, miraculously, they skyrocketed. Um, and then I knew that this was going to be a nightmare for our working class people. And so I started speaking up about it. I started also to research the longer term problem that preceded the money printing, and that is the bureaucratic gatekeepers who block construction. And what I found is that we have the fewest homes per capita of any country in the G7, even though we have by far the most land to build on. Uh, we have, and the reason is we have the second slowest building permits in the OECD. Uh, permitting co costs equal $1.3 million for every new home in Vancouver. In, in Ontario, uh, many municipalities have raised development charges 900% in a couple mm -hmm. of decades, even though there have been no 900% increases in the costs for those municipalities. Um, Montreal has blocked 24,000 homes. Winnipeg just blocked 2,000 homes next to a transit station built for those homes because the city councillor said his, his constituents didn't want neighbours. And what is Trudeau doing? He's giving these bureaucratic gatekeepers more federal infrastructure money to gatekeep. So my common sense plan is one, cap spending and cut ways to balance the budget so we can bring down interest rates. Two, let's require municipalities permit 15% more home building per year as a condition of getting federal funds. Those that beat the target will get bonuses. I'll require every federally funded transit station uh, be pre-permitted for high-density apartments all around them uh, so seniors and students can live next to the bus and train, sell off 6,000 federal buildings, thousands of acres of federal land so we can build, 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 build. This is a common sense plan to build homes, not print money. I, but I, that sounded like a plan, and I keep hearing from Justin Trudeau that you have no plan, so... You just heard the plan, and I've been talking... I. I rolled out my housing plan, I think it was in spring of 2022. It was almost two years ago now. And at the time, he said everything was fine. Um, so now he's trying to play catch up. But the problem is that I think he's doing, doing building on his earlier failures, which is let's build more bureaucracy. He's pumping more cash into local bureaucracies. And they, they, they reward him with a photo op. He comes, shows up to the mayor says, here's your check, Mr. Mayor. The mayor turns around and gives Trudeau a pat on the back and thanks him for all the wonderful things he's done to double housing costs. And they get and the media gives them gushing coverage. But that will not reduce rent or mortgage payments between now and the election.
One of the things you said that's part of your plan is that you want to uh, cap spending and cut waste. Now, we've heard that the the government is, uh, the Trudeau government keeps saying you're going to cut, cut, cut. You are going to uh, bring about austerity. And they always mention things like child care or your health care. Um, talk to me about that. Where would you find savings? Because I've looked at the numbers. The cost of this government has gone up between 40 and 50 percent, I believe it is, over the past couple of years. We're not getting services that are that much better, and it's more than double the inflation rate. So the money's going somewhere. Where would you find savings? I'd get rid of the $35 billion infrastructure bank that hasn't completed a single project in the five, in the five years it's existed. The $54 million Arrive Can app, the $1 billion so-called green tech fund, uh, of which $150 million has already been diverted uh, to liberal and government insiders and misappropriate. I get rid of that fund all together. Um, I would bring in a uh, pay-as-you-go law that requires government find a dollar of savings for every new dollar of spending uh, to root out waste and mismanagement and incentivize bureaucrats to optimize use of dollars. Um, those are but a few examples of wasteful spending that would, oh, by the way, <laughs> They've increased the money they spend on external consultants uh, by about $11 billion. So we now spend $21 billion or $1,400 for every Canadian household on federally uh, hired uh, external consultants. This is, as I said, a 100% increase, often to do the work that could be done in-house by our increasingly growing bureaucracy. So I would cut back on that. So I, I, those are some very specific examples of places I would save the money. Uh, that would uh, allow us to bring down inflation, interest rates, and taxes. Mr. Poliev, Pierre, thank you very much for your time. Uh, we could thank keep you. talking for a long time, but we're out. So uh, enjoy Christmas. We'll talk again in the, in the new year. So Merry Christmas to you and yours. Thank you very much, Brian. Merry Christmas to you. Let me know what you think. Drop a comment down below. Share this on social media. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel.